So I'm Drew Gallatin. Uh, I do uh, FreeBSD performance work for our CDN servers at Netflix. And usually I give talks about how to make things better. But today I'm going to give a talk about basically wh what breaks when I disable certain optimizations, basically how do I make things worse. So just to give you a bit of background, um, there's 800 gigs in the title, and we will get to 800 gigs. And we, we got to 800 gigs last fall, just after the last year of ESDCon. Um, and, I, I, and, and that kind of motivated me to, to look back and see like, how much the various optimizations that, the, that we and the FreeBSD community have made over the years have helped us. So I want to emphasize the FreeBSD community, because most of the things I'm talking about today weren't done at Netflix. Most of them were done by the great people in the community, um, that are some of which are here at this, at this conference. And the other thing you're going to notice is that there's only one optimization between you and you know, chaos a lot, of, a, a lot of times. So to give a background of what we do on our CDN servers, we run FreeBSD Current, we run the, uh, the Nginx web server, and we have the easiest job in the world because we just serve static files via send file. Uh, this, is the ho this is the hardware I'm going to be talking about for most of the talk. There's some 800 gig stuff at the end, but it's a lot easier to uh, abuse a 400 gig machine. There's a lot less of a blast radius if, something, if I crash something. So I, did most, I do most of my exper experiments on a 400 gig machine, which is a, an older uh, Rome-based AMD with sufficient networking and memory bandwidth. So um, I came up with a metric, compare these different optimizations, um, where basically I call it the gigabits per second per CPU metric. And that way we can, it, we can compare optimizations where, say, the max bandwidth is a lot lower than it could be. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to start, I'm going to start with the best setup, and I'm going to just going to keep making things worse. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, like, this is how we actually run things where we're running uh, NIC kernel TLS with send file, and all of our optimizations are enabled, and we get about 375 gigs at about 53% CPU. And with my new metric, we can call that 7.1. And as I go through the optimizations, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the performance and why the performance sucks, and I'm going to show you flame graphs. So this is a flame graph, and the thing to take away from this is that what you're really looking at for slowness, if I can get to my laser, pointer, which is stuck in my pocket. Um, what you're really looking for is you can see these plateaus. Basically, everywhere there's a plateau, you're spending time, and it's an opportunity to, you know, to optimize something. And you see there's not a lot of like, great big plateaus in this. This is, this is what we look like in our optimal setup. So first, I'm going to talk about uh, send file and kernel TLS. So this is my favorite picture. So basically, what this picture uh, you know, depicts is the data flow path. And in this case, it's the data flow path if we weren't using uh, send file in, in, in kernel TLS. So to serve 400 gigs, basically, we have to read 50 gigabytes a second or 400 gigabits a second from storage. And then we need to read it out of the, out of the kernel you know, with, with a copy out. So it gets read and written to user space. Then in user space, it gets read and written to encrypt it. And then to put it back in the kernel, it gets read and written again, and then the NIC sends it. And so that um, means we need basically you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of these 50 gigabytes a second, or 400 gigabytes a second. And if you go back a few slides, like I said, the, uh, the memory bandwidth on this box is about 150 gigabytes a second. So that's quite a difference. And so now, first what I'm going to talk about is what is send file? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be talking about how we get rid of, of these lines. So first, what's send file? Basically, it's something that was come up with in, in the 90s or so, where essentially you give the kernel a, uh, some file descriptors, a file, and a socket, and the kernel, you tell the kernel, send you know, this much from this file descriptor on this socket. And the nice thing is no data goes to user space, and the web server never has to even look at the data it's sending. So the first problem we ran into with this, like way back in the, in the early 2000 aughts, before we were doing, before we were even doing TLS, is that when an Nginx worker is blocked, it can't serve as other requests. And so you can imagine if you're going to a spinning disk, it could be you know 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds before the disk read comes back. So you don't want your web server stuck because a whole bunch of requests could come in in that time. 
And so there's a bunch of different solutions to prevent Nginx from blocking like this. One uh, we used at the time was AIO. And since then, they've added uh, thread pools. So and in, re in reaction to that, um, some folks uh, from Nginx, FreeBSD, and Netflix came up with this, this thing called async send file, where essentially you don't need to sort of cover up the latency. Um, what happens is basically send file becomes fire and forget. And when you, when you, do, when you do send file, basically, um, the Ng Nginx web server will allocate uh, buffers pages to store the data and put, attach them to the socket buffers, and then initiate a disk read request. And so at the top of this diagram, we have a very primitive de depiction of a socket buffer. And then TCP is sort of the gateway here of what gets sent out to the internet. Here's the web server. And it's making a request to the disks to read some stuff, and it's allocating pages in the socket buffer. And now these pages have been allocated, but they're marked not ready. That's what those little stop signs mean. And once the, uh, the disk read comes in, in the context of the interrupt handler, we go ahead and, and we mark all these uh, pages in, in the socket buffers ready. And then finally, when they're all there, the TCP is, is allowed to send it, and then they go out on the wire. And the nice thing about this is that um, this is all done like, with existing kernel threads. Um, since, it's, since the marking of ready and the triggering of the TCP stack is done out of the disk interrupt handler. And that was a really clever solution, and it's, it's, like, it's tremendously useful. So now, what's kernel TLS? Basically, I've talked about this at like, every conference for the last three or four years. Uh, we, moved, we moved bulk crypto into the kernel. And the whole reason we did this is to preserve the send file pipeline. And so now, here's, here's the original diagram we started with. And with, uh, with send file and kernel TLS, we can get rid of a bunch of these arrows, and now things become a whole lot more possible. We still have four of the arrows, which me means we still have 200 gigabytes a second of bandwidth we're using. So that means that um, you know, we still can't get the full 400 gigs, but we're in a lot better shape than we used to be. Uh, now, what's NIC kernel TLS? Basically, that allows us to remove these remaining two lines, because the NIC is, is all of a sudden going to do the crypto. And now we're down to a, needing 100, whoops, I just hit a bunch of arrows. Now we're down to needing 100 gigabytes of memory bandwidth, which is less than the 150. And so now, this, now 400 gigs is possible on this system. And so now here's where I start making things worse. So what happens if we disable uh, kernel TLS and async send file? Um, I was expecting basically max uh, you know, elevated CPU and memory bandwidth usage. Um, but what I actually found was lock intention in, in AIO. So we got to about to 40 gigs, and we were just stuck spinning on locks. So you can see the, the ideal performance metric of 7.1 uh, gigabits per second per CPU down to like way less than one with AIO. And the flame graph, I was talking about how plateaus are bad. And whenever you see these plateaus with lock delay, you know you've got lock intention problems. And like you're spending all your time just spinning on locks. So let's move away from that. Let's not solve a problem with AIO because we're not really going to you know, use it. So let's try the Linux solution, uh, you know, the solutions more commonly found in Linux of using the async thread pools. So this did a little bit better. This got to, to be at 90 gigs or so. And this is more what I was expecting because you know, we, have the additional, uh, we have the additional data copies. And so I was expecting to see a lot of time spent access to memory. And that's what we see. So you, you notice that it's way better than AIO, but still nowhere near as good as the optimal configuration. And now you see the, uh, these plateaus are copy, are copy in, copy out. Um, and there's a mem copy uh, in Nginx, and you know, it's doing the crypto. So there's, you know, there's a, lot, a lot of these plateaus are just basically accessing memory. So that's kind of what I expected. Now for the next trick, we disable send file, but we still use kernel TLS. And this is somewhat surprising um, that, it, that it, it actually got worse. But the reason it got worse is because, at least my assumption of the reason it got worse, is because when we're doing the crypto in user space rather than the kernel, the crypto, uh, you know, the, the data that's being encrypted is hot in the cache from, from being read in from the, from the kernel. And so this is, you know, again, a little bit worse. And you can see still the same. Lots of plateaus. 
But you also see we're doing kernel TLS. That's what this KTLS stuff means. So then, let's try to make things better. Let's disable send file, but we're using the kernel TLS. And so now we're back to about 95 gigs. Um, and in addition to some lock intention, we're still accessing memory more than I thought we would. There's some extra mem copy in Nginx uh, for, for, for SSL, which I don't understand and I haven't tried to hunt down. But it, if I was actually using this, I would hunt it down. But for the purpose of this talk, I just kind of recorded it. And so you can see it's, it's a little bit better than, we used, than, than it used to be, but not, still not great. So it just sort of goes to show you, you can have all these great things like kernel TLS or NIC kernel TLS, and it won't help you at all if you don't use it right. And so again, lots of plateaus for memory copies, and copy in, copy out. And for some reason, Nginx is doing a huge mem, mem copy, which I don't understand. Something, same thing I would hunt down if we were actually using this mode. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we run software kernel TLS. And we don't run software kernel TLS just out of the box uh, from previous day. We install the, the ISAL uh, KMOD. And what, what's ISAL? Basically, it's Intel wrote um, some really hand-coded assembly that can do a bunch of stuff like compression for storage. And it was originally intended for storage, but it also does bulk crypto. And the thing that we like about this is that it allows us to, it, it, it uses non-temporals. And so what that allows is, is allows you to avoid this read, modify, write situation where if you're trying to write, say, eight bytes to a 64-byte cache line, the way a CPU works is it will read the data from that cache line into memory and sort of insert the eight bytes in the, somewhere in the middle of the cache line and then write it back. Well, the problem is that it's going to read all those things. It reads reading that for no reason because we're really going to be replacing all those cache lines and non-temporals allow us to just write it. And so that saves us some memory bandwidth. So you can see that um, this, this next one is like before we discovered ISAL and we're running uh, you know, with send file kernel TLS but no ISAL. And you can see it's you know, less, less than ideal, but we don't have the thing we need to compare it with, which is if we do run with ISAL. So we go from about 180 to about 240 gigabits. And you can see in the flame graph, oops, the difference is we have you know, the, 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 AES, the GCM that's in the kernel. And there's some extra mem copies, again, which if we were using this, I would hunt down. But for now, I'm just recording them. But you see that with ISAL, uh, it's a different crypto routine, and there's no mem copies. So now we're kind of getting out of my comfort zone, and I'm going to talk about some virtual memory optimizations. And one of the most important things we optimizations, at least to Netflix, to our workload, is the, uh, the basically the UMA per CPU uh, page cache. And this was, I think, originally conceived of at, Net, at Netflix, at least, I, and it was probably independently conceived of at other places. Uh, Randall Stewart and I think Scott Long wrote this sort of pre-UMA uh, hand-coded thing. And I think it may have been, I think it may partially have been for my salon, I don't really remember. But the idea was there was a, a per CPU pool of free pages. And as you'll see later, one of the biggest sources of lock intention uh, we have is accessing the page queues. And so if you can bypass those queues and just not take any locks and just have a per CPU you know, pool, then that should give you some better performance. Uh, more recently, it was, uh, it was upstreamed when it was, I think Mark Johnson did the work, and it was uh, basically um, managed by UMA, because UMA is really good at having per CPU caches. And the, the critical thing is it only works for free pages. It doesn't work for, for things in the inactive queue or the active queue. So it's, again, limited to free stuff. So like for the next experiment, I'm going to disable the, the, the page cache. Basically, everything is configured optimally with NIC kernel TLS sun file. All the stuff we were talking about in the previous section is, in, is enabled. And you wind up um, with some really bad performance, even worse than oh, some of the things in the first section. And that's because you, you've got all this lock intention when we are freeing pages and allocating them. So. Another incredibly useful optimization for Mark Johnson was v VM batch queues. And basically, VM batch queues are a, essentially a, a way to relieve some of the lock intention on all the different page queues. Instead of taking a lock, processing one page, adding it to a queue, 
and then releasing the lock, what happens is you store up in a per CPU area a number of pages, and then once you finally reach, reach the maximum number of pages, you take the lock and then push them all as a, as a group to the page queues. And so I dis when you disable this, at least with our workload, you lose quite a bit of performance. So you go from about you know, 375 to about you know, 280 or so with CPU maxed out. And things look better than before, but you still see lots of uh, lock intention when we are uh, bringing things uh, to the, uh, I believe it's to the inactive queue here. Um, you, you see the, the page queue batch, that's just because the way I disabled this was I hacked the size to be, to, to be zero so that it was always just submitting things as soon as it got them, this is the batch size was zero. Um, Another really important optimization for us is SF no cache. And that is a flag to send file. Um, and the idea is that it causes send file to just directly free the page into the, into the free list or the per CPU uh, free, free pool rather than to try to go through the inactive queue. And we do this because we have a gauge of how popular uh, various content is. And so if somebody's watching something that's that we don't think anybody else is going to watch that same chunk of that same video and that same encoding um, in the next couple minutes. When the client requests it, we have the web server mark it with SF no cache. And that means, like I said, that we just throw it away. And so that relieves a lot of contention on the inactive queue by making better use of this per CPU uh, free pool. And so if we disable that, again, we wreck performance. So we go down to 120 gigs at 55% CPU. Um, so it's one things that, one of the things that it, it, yeah, I'm tripping over my tongue. One of the things that's interesting here is that in most cases, when we have bad performance, the CPU is maxed out. But it's not maxed out in this case. But the problem is that the clients are just running away in terror because Nginx is not uh, answering their requests in a timely fashion. And so we get to about 120 gigs, and the Nginx keeps getting delayed by lock intention, so we keep going somewhere else. Uh, and here's a kind of a running table of how, how, we, how we can break things. So, you know, with no page cache, it's really terrible. No batch queue, it's not great, but not horrible. And with no, no cache, it's pretty bad. And again, here with no cache, you'll end up seeing um, lots of, even with batch queues, you end up seeing lots of contention on, on the inactive queue, and you wind up um, spinning on locks again and spending all the kernel time on that. So I'm going to segue to a different architecture. So we've recently been, in the last year or two, been playing with ARM64. And if you notice a lot of our flame graphs, we spend a lot of our time in page management. And one of the things that was just enabled in ARM64 in the last few months um, was 16K pages. I just want to thank Andrew Turner for that. And also Warner and Chuck and um, and Kirk for figuring out some weird uh, implications of 16k pages and, and the file systems and the and the and the disk and the disk drivers. And so by doing by using 16k pages, we see a huge performance improvement on our Ampere box. We go from about 345 gigs to about 368 gigs. And if you notice, the CPU is basically maxed and is down to you know, having you know, substantial idle time. And I didn't write out all the details of this machine, but this machine's essentially identical to the AMD, except it's, it's an Ampere, uh, 80, 80 core, 3 gigahertz, 128 gigs of RAM, with uh, you know, sufficient TLS offload NICs to be able to push 400 gigs. And so just to compare, the, the same metric I'm using, this is the first time we've seen it on ARM. We go from a, a little over 4 to a, around 5 when we enable 16K pages. And just to show you the difference in the flame graphs, this is 4K pages. And you see you know, time spent in the VM page functions. And we see some big plateaus, big plateaus. And then if you go to 16K pages, notice how everything got a little bit narrower. And that's us recovering CPU time and kind of doing, doing, more with, doing more work with less effort, which is always a good thing. All right. So now I'm going to talk about some network stack optimizations that are 
pretty important to us. And these are, some of these are pretty basic things. Like the, one of the most basic things is LRO. So TCP um, is pretty expensive to run. So when a packet comes in off the wire, um, there's a lot of processing that needs to happen. And one of the things that I, I, I did the first LRO in FreeBSD, and it was very simplistic. It was later, you know, moved out of the driver I maintained and into, and into the, uh, you know, the, the actual TCP stack. But it, basically, I did the initial LRO because I was working for a, a 10 gig NIC company, and with a standard 1500 byte MTU in 2006, you couldn't receive anywhere close to, uh, to 10 gigs. And with LRO, basically, it batches up packets as they're being received. So that if you're receiving, it, it works on you know eight connections, and it finds a packet for the first connection, appends it to a chain. But the next packet that comes in, it gets appended to a chain, and you, you keep building these chains of these eight connect of packets on these eight connections. When the chain gets to the maximum size, or you start seeing other connections, you flush the the chains. So that that was enabled us enabled us on some you know horribly weak 2006 you know single core AMD box to get from, I think it was like two and a half gigs a second to 10 gigs a second with some idle time. Um, and there's been a lot of advancements made to it since then. Uh, but the whole, the, whole, the whole advantage of it is essentially you avoid running the TCP stack, you know, eight times, 16 times, 40 times, whatever your maximum aggregation size is. And that just saves a lot of CPU time. And so if we disable LRO, we see a a little bit of a drop in performance. You know, we see about 330 gigs at 65% CPU. And one of the things I noticed is that when we do this, the NIC starts to drop some packets. And so that impacts our health. I haven't talked about that. That's kind of the Netflix specific thing. And basically health is kind of a signal to the load generator that we're not healthy and it should send traffic elsewhere. And so, you know, lots of things will impact health, high CPU usage, uh, dropping packets, uh, dis high disk latency, high NGINX response latency, whatever. But basically, by dropping health, it's telling clients to go somewhere else. And so with LRO disabled, we, we reach a, a max of about 330 gigs before the clients start going somewhere else. And you can see that's probably one of the, one of the optimizations that has the least effect because you know, it's the, pretty much the highest bar of anything we've seen so far. Um, and here is a flame graph, and it shows uh, spending you know, lots of time in the TCP stack out of, out of the network interrupt handler. And so the next thing I'm going to talk about is RSS accelerated LRO. And Hans Peter came up with that from, from Mellanox. And if you remember, I was talking about LRO, it's got a limited number of connections it can process. It keeps track of like eight connections at once. Well, in a workload like, like Netflix's, we might have um, you know, a NIC with, say, 32 queues. And we might have, say, you know, 100,000 connections. And so that's roughly 3,000 connections per queue. And so the odds that um, a whole bunch of packets on the same connection are going to arrive close enough together um, so that they can be processed all together is pretty minuscule. So Hans came up with this super clever idea um, where what you do is you gather all the packets up in a big bunch before you submit them to LRO. And then before you submit them, you sort them um, by the RSS hash that came off of the network card and their arrival time. And so what happens is you, trans you transform this mishmash of packets that are all from different connections into runs of packets from the same connection. And when you do that, LRO can actually process them. And essentially, if we disable, if we disable this, I mean, the number's a little bit different. The, the, we get to 70% CPU. And here's one of the reasons why I've got this metric. Because you can see that this is essentially, this, this, if we disable all of LRO, we're here. And if we disable just the RSS assist, that makes LRO pretty ineffective, and it's almost the same as disabling. You can see this, this big gap between these two, which is bigger than the, than the bandwidth gap would indicate. And again, we see you know, lots of activity in the TCP stack coming out of uh, the network interrupt handler. And another thing which is super important is uh, TSO. And so the principle is the same 
The difference is that this requires cooperation from the network card, and pretty much all network cards since the early 2000s have supported this, even the cheap things. And so the idea is that, like LRO, we just reduce the number of trips to the network stack. And so if the TCP stack decides he's got the space to send, say, 64K to um, a client, rather than uh, you know, looping through and sending one packet, 1,500 bytes, one packet, 1,500 bytes, 40 sometimes, it just sends a huge, gigantic 64K packet down you know, through, the lower, through the lower parts of the network stack to the, uh, to the network driver. And then the network uh, card itself is responsible for replicating uh, the IP header and you know, in, in replicating the TCP headers and making and splitting that 64K TCP chunk up into a bunch of valid 1,500-byte Ethernet frames. And so on the host side, that avoids a lot of trips to the network stack and also avoids allocating a lot of MBUF headers and a lot of uh, you know, queue manipulations in the, in the socket buffers. And so if we disable TSO, we get to about 180 gigs at 85% CPU. Uh, and this, this number took a little while to get because I needed to disable interrupt coalescing um, just because we're putting so much more pressure on the, uh, on the trans transmit descriptor rings. And as you can see, there's a lot more time spent in, oh, I actually, oh no, uh, there it is. You, see, you can see a lot more time spent in uh, the network driver. I don't think we've ever seen ether output and the, the Mellanox transmit routines showing up this prominently. Uh, and that's just because, like I said, we've, we're calling them probably 10, 20 times more frequently. Because you, you don't always have 64K things to send, and the network guys hate it, actually, actually sending 64K at once. They like to send at most, say, eight, because they worry about buffers overflowing on the, on the client side. So now the, let's disable both TS, TL, TSO and LRO to get, reduce all of our batching to zero. And that takes it down a little bit. We get down to 170 gigs. And again, the same IRQ coalescing constraint. And so this is no, no TSO, and this is no TSO and no LRO. And you can again see lots of uh, network stack stuff, lots of prominent, prominent ether output and Melnax driver calls. And you know, everything is everything is much worse just because we're running things so much more, more often, doing so much more work for no reason. Now I'm going to get to the interesting part of the talk, the, 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 the headline part of the talk. So last year, um, I really wanted to give some results on an 800 gig box, and I couldn't because it got stuck in some kind of shipping snafu. But that was a year ago, and so I've had a year to play with the thing. Um, it was, it's a Dell um, R7525 with uh, two Milan 64-core 64 64 CPUs. And the important thing is that it has um, three links be between the sockets, uh, and that will become important later. It has half a terabyte of RAM and uh, enough Mellanox ConnectX6 NICs to, to, to drive 800 gigs and, and enough storage to feed it. So the first time we fired the thing up, um, we got 420 gigabits out of it, which is not very impressive. Um, and if you remember from my NUMA talks from a few years ago, there's a bunch of different ways you can run, I can, I can figure NUMA machines to run the Netflix workload. And I'm, we're running what I'm calling the network siloing mode, where basically um, connections are hashed by the incoming NICs to a particular NUMA node, and we try to do all that work local to the node that we can. So during this test, the CPUs were mostly idle, um, but we started. We, but we were dropping packets like crazy. And so a, what AMD guessed was that the links between the uh, the CPUs were were down uh, down linking to to by two, just just to uh, just to save power. And it took the CPU load as a signal for it should be saving power. And so you can force that to, you can force them to, to not down clock or down train. And by doing that, um, it's called dynamic link width management. If you turn that off, we get up to 500 gigs. And that's again, um, network siloing mode. And the important thing to know here is that means that the, the data from the NVMe drives is getting directly DMA'd from the NUMA node where the NVMe drives are, 
for, to a different NUMA node where the NICs are. Um, and one thing we noticed using AMD's profiling tools, which are available on their website, by the way, so anybody can use them, is that the XGMI link was very, very unevenly utilized. There were 15 gigabytes a second on one link, and then 4 gigabytes a second on another, and 2 gigabytes a second on a third. And so what AMD eventually told us was that um, when you are doing DMA across the NUMA bus, which, which we're doing because we're doing the network siloing, then the XGMI link that's chosen is chosen based on the location um, on the originating uh, CPU socket of the device doing the DMA. And the problem is that there's essentially four I.O. Uh, chips in a I.O. quadrants in, a, in an AMD CPU, and it hashes by like what quadrant the I.O. device is in. And unfortunately, with this Dell, things are very uneven, and most of the NVMe drives are in the same I.O. quadrant, which is, which is why we're seeing you know, such even use of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the XGMI links. And so, What, one of the things we can do to improve this is, remember how I said we're DMAing to, to the next NUMA node. If we decided to DMA to the uh, NVMe drives NUMA node, then this goes away, and the NICs are much more evenly distributed. And so when we're, hash, when we're hashing based on the NICs location, then the XGMI links are going to be more evenly, evenly utilized. So that's what I did. I flipped things so that now we're doing DMA directly to the, to the node that NVMe is on. And that helped things a little bit. That got us up to about 670 gigs. Um, and, the X, and like I hope, the XGMI was much, much more even at uh, 10, 10, and 7. Um, now, doing this is problematic uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, and I'm going to make things more problematic in a second, and then I'm going to go over all the problems. So now I. At this point, I decided to turn on full disk-centric disc siloing, which, if you saw my talk from a couple of years ago, basically means that in addition to DMAing stuff to the, to the NUMA node where the NICs live, I actually migrate the TCP connections to uh, that node. So we essentially um, you know, tear down KTLS on the, on the original node, and then we move the, move the TLS connection to software, and then we move the TLS connection to hardware on the new node. And so now... Um, no matter what node the, you know, the, the TCP packets are coming in into, they're always going to go out of the same node that has the NVMe storage for the connection. So the idea is that there will be like zero NUMA crossings for, for bulk data, which will help with this XGMI stuff. Now, there's a lot of problems with doing it this way, and which is one of the reasons why I would never actually run it this way in production. Because when you're running the network siloing mode, the, the traffic is basically uh, distributed or sharded by the, uh, the hash that's done by LACP to the, to the NIC ports. Um, and that's a hash over the IP and port, and port ranges. And so that's a hash in, over you know, this huge, like hundreds of, hundreds of thousands or millions of, possible, millions of possible things. And so the hashes end up being really, really evenly distributed. So your load is evenly, very, very evenly distributed between NUMA nodes. But all of a sudden, if you do disk-centric siloing, um, it depends on where your content is. And that's, you're choosing between, say, 8 or 16 NVMe drives. And 8 or 16 is a lot less en entropy than hundreds of thousands of, or millions. And so if you have a title that's like, really popular, then all of, the, all of the traffic for that is going to end up on one NUMA node if you're doing disk-centric siloing. But if, you're doing, if you were doing network-centric siloing, it would, it would be distributed all over, you know, over evenly across the NUMA nodes. So the problem with this is if you have a really popular title or you, or you're, you have just you know, a hot disk, then that will translate into a hot NUMA node. And you'll have maybe one NUMA node which is reaching bandwidth limits on the NICs and another NUMA node which is just loping along. And, so, and I mentioned we moved TLS sessions. That's kind of expensive. That's something I'd rather not do. Um, and the other problem is that once we do this, you know, affinities for a lot of things are now wrong. Um, and especially we have TCP acts coming in on the wrong NUMA node and then getting processed across, across the NUMA bus, which adds latency to the processing. 
the TCP pasting is, is being done in the wrong node. I mean, that's something I could, I could probably fix if I had to. But, um, so yeah, I think I already talked about the uneven sharding. But we got some good results from it, for, just for a science experiment. So we can get to 731 gigabits in this, in this configuration. Um, and that's because doing the disc-centric siloing pretty much takes almost all the load off the XGMI links, you know, except for just CPU cross-traffic. And at this point, we're limited by uh, net network output drops, not CPU. And the cause of the drops is basically due to those disc-centric siloing problems I was mentioning. In some cases, um, one node is just being pushed too hard with respect to how much memory is, is being used. If there's a, the other thing I didn't mention is that if there's a hot node, um, our, our software, which decides what content is popular, isn't NUMA aware. And so it will make this cache or no cache decision just globally based on how much memory is in the system, not on how much memory is on each NUMA node. So you wind up with um, the page daemon kind of going crazy on one node because it's, because it's not enough stuff is being directly freed. And the other problem is, like I said, with hot content, um, you wind up with uh, one node doing more and one node doing less. So all the NICs on one node in, my, in this experiment were doing 94 gigs, and all the nodes, all the NICs on the other node were doing 89 gigs. And so I think that's about it. Um, and I have time for questions now. I have, I have way more time than I thought. I think I must have rushed through this because I, I was worried about the whole thing fitting. So. Yes. I can repeat the question if I can hear you. Um, how much further do you think you can get if clients start using Wix? That's actually one of the reasons why I give this talk is because, you know, Quick is essentially, here, let me, so let me go back to the slides. Quick is essentially, I probably should have done an explicit thing, but so let's see. We're, Where's my, where's my quick? So right now, quick, right now, quick is basically the dumb way um, because there's no send file for it. Everything's happening in user space, but we're still reading things. We're still, we're still reading things from the, through the kernel. And so quick is essentially the, the TLS uh, in user space case. And so, you know, that just, that destroys the performance. Uh, also, and the other bad thing about quick is that it's the, it's the combination of that with, from the networking section, with, with TSO and, L, and LRO disabled. Now there's, there's some, uh, you know, hardware vendors working on quick offload. I was actually talking to a small company, which I think, it, last time I talked to them was last winter, and I think they've actually uh, gone bankrupt out of business, unfortunately. Uh, but they, were, they actually had a quick offload solution. Uh, which did, which did you know essentially kernel TLS and like send file for quick, but until you know solutions like that get popular, I have really huge concerns about quick for performance reasons. Uh, is there something preventing you from duplicating hot data to other NUMA zones? I'm sorry, I missed the critical part of the question. Is there something preve preventing me from what? Uh, duplicating data to other, uh, to other NUMA zones. That's hot data. I'm so uh, sorry. Hot content. Can you take your mask off just for ah. a second? Uh, is there something preventing you from copying hot content to other NUMA zones? No, there's not. It's just, it's, it's just, uh, it's, basically, it's basically development work. And the way we view these NUMA platforms now is essentially as research vehicles to see what problems we're going to hit internally with our infrastructure and with our other software um, when we get to these bandwidths. So for example, this, this machine is essentially a prototype of a future-looking machine 
with, uh, you know, based, based around the next generation uh, DDR5, which doubles, more than doubles the memory bandwidth, and uh, PCI Express Gen 5. Uh, and so, you know, we were hoping that, we would ha that I would have results from a machine like that to share, because I really didn't want to talk about NUMA. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this became about NUMA, but ju we just don't have those machines yet. The, we don't have the PCI Express Gen 5, uh, you know, 400 gig NICs yet. We don't have uh, the, these platforms based on DDR5 yet. But it, the interesting thing that, w that we found on, with this science experiment is what was really killing us was, was two things, was logging and was some local stuff we have to do socket buffer, uh, socket buffer uh, resource management. So we, so we sort of treat Nginx as a, uh, a one Nginx worker and we give him a quote of how much socket buffers he can use. And that code was kind of getting, in, getting a little bit in the way along with some, just the way we do, we do logging. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, uh, so you said that with the disk space, uh, disk based siloing, you have the problem that um, the, the incoming connection might be on the wrong NIC and you, you have costs with moving it and probably stuff going on, uh, going out on the wrong NIC. Yes. So have you thought about um, exposing that with multiple IPs and making the network aware with PGP or something else aware on which, which NIC it should be interrogated for? Specific that's, content. that's one solution, but the IPv4 address space is limited, and these are all internet-facing addresses. So we'd rather not burn more IP addresses. And I mean, there's a lot of solutions that we could use if we really had to. But like I said, this is just a, a research vehicle. It's not designed to be production. And in fact, another thing we could do is that you know, after my first talk in 2019 about NUMA, somebody came up to me and made me aware that there were extensions um, to LACP where you could notify the, uh, the router that you wanted to move a connection. Uh, we don't have that implemented in our router's firmware, uh, at least as far as our network team was aware. So it's not a solution that, that you know, I could use today. But there are a lot of things that could be done to make disk-centric siloing real. It's just that it's, given its current status as a research vehicle, it's just not worth you know, the, the extra effort. That's one of the reasons why I've never upstreamed any of this stuff, because you know, I upstreamed some research stuff in 1999 which for zero copy sockets, which ended up haunting me for years. So no more research stuff in the upstream. Anybody else? Final, final chance. All right, thank you.